Hello. Hey guys. How's it going? It's going. It's going. We'll uh we'll wait till a few more people get in here. <laughs> um I don't I don't know if you heard Jonathan what happened, but we kind of lost two of our guest speakers last minute. Oh, I missed that. Yeah, all good. So we'll just have a cool conversation um, about a few different topics. We'll get you involved. Absolutely. You know, for sure. When I tweet out. Yeah, if it's you, then I guess we'll have to. Absolutely. All right. So we'll uh, we'll get started, and I'm sure people will start to come in um, as we go along here. But, um, you know, great to kick off uh, the first of this type of space that we're going to be running from the Infinity account every single Tuesday. Um, it's going to be me, Alec Beckman, uh, as the host. I'm the director of digital assets and I'm joined by, uh, my co-hosts, Noah Pollock and Jackson Blau, as well as our in-house, uh, counsel lawyer, Uh, so super excited. We're going to be talking about a number of topics before we get to those. Uh, just wanted to say that, um, we were supposed to have JP Richardson on the, uh, on the space, but, uh, the, CEO of Exodus, but he had an emergency and couldn't come last minute. Um, and we're going to be uh, frequenting multiple guests, including Lawyer Dottieth, as well as uh, Dr. Robert Murphy, our chief economist. Um, but yeah, we're going to have an exciting conversation today around uh, real world assets. Uh, we focused of this Twitter space, uh, and we are going to be, uh, you know, talking today about Infinio, kind of what we're doing around real world assets, uh, our podcast that we. Host uh, hosted by Dr. Robert Murphy, um, some real world asset, um, you know, type uh, type conversations around J.P. Morgan, uh, what they're doing with Onyx, uh, Exodus, um, which is a uh, company that that is a crypto wallet uh, for self custody. Uh, and J.P. Richardson, who was supposed to be here today, it, uh, he uh, was just on the podcast with Dr. Robert Murphy, uh, talking about what they did surrounding their equity. Uh, we're going to talk about some real estate, um, and then we're going to talk about a few different blockchains that are really focusing on uh, on the institutional side, um, you know, specifically specifically um, provenance. So, uh, so yeah, so just wanted to get started, and I think this is a, a good topic to kick off with Lawyer uh, as well as Noah. Uh, so I know you guys, you know, come very heavily from the crypto community, and I wanted to get a sense of is there a narrative surrounding um, surrounding real world assets and what's going on. Um, as as opposed to some of the uh, some of uh, you know the more crypto native uh, assets that have typically um, been thought of in that space. Absolutely, it's huge right now. I mean, people are looking to the next cycle. Um, it's like all they could talk about RW. And it's like I I've been pushing back. It's like I just want to hear the words "real world asset." I I it's something about the three letter acronyms. They just sort of take, take everything over. But I guess we're there, and they're w RWAs, and they're everywhere. Yeah, I mean, the uh, what I've noticed is that a lot of people think the new bull run to be led by AI coins and uh, real world asset coins. Um, what I thought really interesting, though, is, um, you know, the, the whole premise of real world assets in crypto is to make, you know, something a little more tangible, right, that people can invest in. But at the same time, at least these early real world asset coins, um, they don't actually do anything, right? Like you might get some yield in the native token, um, but and they might say it's sharing the platform's revenue. At the same time, if you're you know getting an altcoin back for investing in this platform, um, it doesn't really feel like real yield the way um, some other platforms do it. And I know we're still early in the whole real world asset narrative, um, but I hope to see that uh, you know investors in these projects can actually get um, you know real real yield instead of just their uh, you know magic internet money. Yeah, I, I don't think it falls in like what I think of a let's say a token that gives you platform fees. I think of that as like utility, uh, and you know just a, a regular just cleaning up a bit, just like a regular token, I was going to say the S word, um, with utility. I think that when you look, when you think of real world assets with, with yield, you think of like real yield, where you know, have a, a real asset that exists in the world that creates real yield in the in the economy that you can then, you know, that actually turns into real dollars. Whereas a lot of the, the yield in crypto is inflationary based on the token itself or some other, you know, as they say, Ponzi-nomics. Um, what's exciting, I think, is the real world assets that actually make money. Whether it's you know insurance policies or you know an actor's career or uh, real estate or art or anything, something that can actually exist in the world, 
make money and then the blockchain comes in for um you know provable ownership and transferability that's where things i think get really interesting and you, you know you have actual provable yield and um then we're just using the blockchain to be able to transact in, in an environment where um you don't need middlemen where which is just what the to me the spirit of crypto is cutting up the middlemen whether it's so they stop taking a fee for doing very little or you know to, to maintain some sort of transactional freedom um it's real world assets it's just going to be exactly where it goes well, as you guys or, uh, honestly on that note um i'm just curious how you guys would feel about um a coin like i, I don't know if you're familiar with aspen coin it's actually a uh, tokenized share in the saint regis aspen and what they've done is really interesting i don't think that they pay dividends but what they do is they buy back the token to create pr price pressure and so we've actually seen the token appreciate a lot, like almost 200% over the last couple of years, along with um, some real world benefits. Um, they have a tier program, basically based on how however many tokens you have, you get certain discounts at the actual resort um, in person. And so um, do you guys feel that those tokens are kind of just noise or do you think that those are providing investors real value there? Yeah, great, great question, Jackson. And I think when it comes down to it, the reason that a group would structure a real world asset token or a securities compliant token like that uh, is really around um, how they handle things like taxes. Um, so when you make distributions, there's um, there's a lot that comes in taxes. Um, and uh, so so I think when it comes down to it, you want like the reason that real world assets are coming are becoming tokenized um, is because of the uh, of the benefits that blockchain pro can provide on top of it. So as, as Lord Dadith mentioned, um, you know, I think the transferability, right, is uh, key. A lot of private placements, you think about private assets like real estate today, they're not traded. Um, you know, these are these are assets that people put their money into and you're pretty much at uh, you're pretty much at liberty or at, at bay of the uh, the company. And as long as they want to hold the asset, you are not going to be able to sell that entire thing. So being able to uh, sell equity and shares within that asset um, is definitely something that uh, tokenization is um, taking a like a real, you know, forward thinking approach to. Um, and then furthermore, I think one of the cool things that we're seeing a lot of is because these secondary markets are still being built up and the buy side and the demand side isn't there as much yet. Um, a lot of really cool companies have started to uh, engage in the collateralization of these real world assets. It's a really great use case because you think about DeFi. Uh, the the one of the big problems with DeFi is you can you know make instantaneous loans on different assets, but a lot of these assets don't have tangible value or don't have you know re really like um, you know really a way to constantly do mark to markets uh, like a real estate asset would, or in our case, an ins a life insurance policy would. Uh, so you know I think uh, you know adding some form of liquidity is definitely a differentiation. Um, for a lot of these assets and, uh, you know, it's the more that these liquidity opportunities can, um, can produce themselves, uh, the more efficient this market will be more attractive real world assets will be to the blockchain space. And I think that's a really great segue into, uh, what we're doing at Infinio with life insurance policies. Uh, so for those unfamiliar, uh, with what we're doing, we are actually digitizing, uh, whole life insurance policies, which, um, a lot of people are unfamiliar uh, with, but life insurance policies, specifically permanent and whole life, actually accumulate value time. Uh, as you pay pr uh, premiums, there's a guaranteed dividend of around 4 to 5% every year. So we look at it uh, as more of a fixed income alternative, uh, which is a cool uh, use case because there's always um, a value or really a, a, a net asset value that's attached to these assets. Um, and Lori Dottie, I want to kind of turn it over to you to maybe expand this or yeah. So what's really interesting about that in terms of access, there's two types of people, two types of investors who wouldn't have access normally to real world assets in general, right? And then there's sort of two types of, or let's say a, a gradient of types of real world assets that those people can and can't acquire. So for example, if you're unbanked, if you're, let's say in, you know, someplace in Africa and you just can't get a bank um, account, you really have no way to invest in, let's say, a, lo a gold fund or something like that. Or any of these assets. Well, you maybe you can on a, on a decentralized exchange with just a paper wallet and an internet connection on your phone. Um, so that's one type of person. Those people probably can't get um, get into these some of the real world assets, like maybe insurance policies or some aspect of them um, where you maybe need to KYC. So the, there's this aspect of where you do need regulations and you do need KYC on some types of investments, like some of the things that Infinio is doing. Um, but the difference there is okay. So now this 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 gentleman who's unbanked. 
doesn't now have access to those. But now big institutions that wanted to buy into that, they do. But on the flip side, you've got this gentleman who's on bank. He can go buy other types of real world assets. Let's say like, you know, um, a movie production or whatever else gets uh, tokenized on the blockchain. He now has access to all of these things. Never mind, you know, sound money we can get into. But also all these real world assets that don't require KYC um, that he could just invest in on, on a decentralized exchange. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think I think you raised a really great point around compliance. Um, you know, so I think one of the great things about uh, blockchain with these real world assets is it makes it accessible um, to a larger group of people. Uh, but there's also a big compliance aspect of who can buy into um, a lot of these real world ass uh, assets because they're most of the time securities. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of compliance. There's different exemptions that you can with uh, with different securities governing bodies. Um, but in this case for the U.S., um, you know, there's there's SEC rules around who can participate in specific investments. Um, so, you know, we uh, but but to your your uh, point around someone who's global who doesn't you know have access to specific investments or someone that's unbanked, you can go through um, you know a few different exemptions to make it available to them um, and actually open it up. So it, it really is a uh, a global accessible um, you know uh, attempt at trying to get people in, into different assets and markets, uh, which is really cool. Um, one, I do. I do want to say uh, just because it does go back to what you said before, which is this, what I think actually Jackson said before um, about how some of these things are. Um, they're really just oh, you know, it's a, it's a, an ERC twenty, and it says you get some gold, but we don't know. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of value to that too. And there, it's sort of the same thing. A lot of companies do that if you invest in gold too. The difference is they have to you know be blessed by the SEC. But in in crypto and going saying with the ethos of crypto, there will be companies that that say, look, here's the gold we have. People trust us because of all these very various reasons, and it's one to one, or it's you know fractionalized, or whatever the case may be. And now you have no need for IC; it's all trust. And if they can, if they can prove they have the assets, um, you know, so there's some sort of verification that now you have, um, you have a use for real world assets that for with absolutely no KYC. Um, and, and I'm not saying that there aren't solutions of, that require no KYC to for the more complex compliance um, investments, but I just want to give some cre some credence to those real world assets. Um, tokens out there that might not be so compliant. There still may be some value there um, as long as people are you have to keep your wits about you if you're not going into a, an area that's SEC blessed. But I think we, we also know that based on history, the SEC isn't all that perfect at making sure companies keep their promises and all that. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're, we're talking about this very much from tail perspective. I think it's important to hit on the fact that, um, you know, institutions are going to be able to benefit from uh, the digitization and tokenization of real world assets as well. Um, we're seeing a lot of examples with uh, with JP Morgan and Onyx. Um, and one of the things that they announced last week is they're creating an interoperable system so that, you know, big uh, asset managers like Apollo, uh, who use the same blockchain that we do at Infinio, which is Provenance, uh, can, you know, be held and viewed um, and, and transacted within the JP Morgan Onyx ecosystem. Um, and then furthermore, they've also expanded with with Avalanche to do a similar thing um, with other institutions. So some of the things that institutions could benefit from are obviously the verifiability of assets, the ability to transfer them, uh, the ability to uh, to actually transact. Um, and uh, and furthermore, the the credential piece that you were just talking about, Lawyer.eth, with being able to you know verify uh, their identity with KYC AML using blockchain to create you know really a, a system in which these credentials are held and in which these uh, these credentials will to uh, to be you know easily read between smart contracts. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of institutional adoption. Just wanted to uh, kick it back to you, Lord Dadi. Is there anything specific that you're interested in or that you're seeing on the institutional side uh, rather than the retail side? Yeah, I, well, I think that there's a there's a sort of misconception that um, that blockchain incorporates some sort of lack of transparency. Anyone who gets it understands that it's actually a lot more transparency. But the idea of like, let's say, doing this stuff through the blockchain as opposed to through JP Morgan makes people nervous. But then the reality is, the reality is, we'll see guys like JP Morgan incorporating the blockchain more and more, and um, you know, investors are ultimately going to be more comfortable, not less to see their investment on the blockchain and to understand the, you know, the smart contracts involved and all that great stuff. So I, th I do think that institutions are coming around. Um, and, you know, when you see Larry Fink saying Bitcoin's a flight to, you know, Bitcoin going up is a flight to quality, you can tell that, you know, the, the institutions are coming around and they're 
going to be doing their best at some point to be first movers on a lot of these technologies. Um, and they'll make their centralized versions of it. But I think that there, there's definitely a sense growing that institutions are wising up to the utility of blockchain, not just as a, you know, maybe you put a, a bit in Bitcoin, maybe you put a bit in altcoins. That's not the excitement. The excitement is, yes, the Bitcoin part, but also how do we use this technology in financial products? Great. And quick follow up on that. How do you think blockchain got somewhat of a negative reputation, you know, surrounding um, you know, institutions and assets. And, you know, a lot of people say that, uh, that, you know, a lot of crypto is a scam and, and, um, and that, you know, blockchain is evil. How do we distinct between the two crypto and blockchain? And how do you think they, that, uh, blockchain really received this reputation and what can we be doing to really fix this moving forward? Well, most of the early use case of blockchain was it li- like, it's, it was illicit money with them, you know, off the grid money. And so what's the best use case for that? illicit transactions and then you know made, it made a lot of headlines throughout its use and history for a lot of the bad things and it was really just like the really smart people who actually think about the world and the implications of these things and started to clue into it um but the history was was quite messy and um so i think that that plays into the reality is of course orders of magnitude more fraud and scams are done with money than crypto but the, the, the spotlight's on there because that was a that's kind of the primary use of money that no one knows about. That's changed over the last past few years, of course, but early on that was the case. So I think that that has left a bit of a stain, but, um, you know, and, and it's still going on, right? We just had an SVF and, um, you know, there's still, it's still being cleaned up, but I do think at least on the institutional level for the people who are paying attention, there's two things. One, it is being cleaned up and regulations are being straightened out. And two, Bitcoin is unscathed, right? So um, I think that's, that's all settling in. Great. Uh, so I want to kick this over to Noah for a second. Um, so I think one of the really exciting things to me is that there's all this infrastructure that's been built around, um, you know, collateralization of assets through DeFi. Um, and Noah, I would love if you could speak to what's available out there, because I think truly what's so exciting to me is people have spent so much time with, you know, assets and, and building out infrastructure that allows people to do amazing things like borrow and lend. And applying that to real world assets is is something that, you know, we've done as a company, a lot of people are focused on. So no, what what have you seen in DeFi so far that, you know, is, is an incredible use case that can be applied to real world assets? And one of the cool things is, you know, uh, physical items. There's a few platforms out there where you can, you know, put up your Rolex as collateral and get an instant loan. Um, I think things like that are, are really starting to take off. Um, as well as anything else, I'm, I was at NYC, uh, NFT NYC last year and someone was doing it with like rare sneakers as well. Um, and so I think less, than, you know, just as much as like real estate and treasuries are going to be something you can collateralize. Uh, I think everyday items in the future, as well as digital collectibles. Um, it could even be, I saw something in a, a video game, like a gun skin just sold for like 20 some Ethereum, uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, and as you know, as we go into a more digital world and digital collectibles, um, start becoming more and more a part of everyday life. I think we'll just see, you know, people taking out loans against things that, you know, a lot of people in this space could see as, uh, you know, useless. Uh, so I think that's really interesting and going to be cool to see where the world goes with that. Um, but kind of something else I wanted to touch on that I was thinking about this whole whole thing. Um, I know in our in our most recent uh, podcast with uh, JP Richardson, he talked a lot about, you know, not your keys, not your crypto. And it kind of made me think about in this, you know, real world asset future, um, if it's, you know, nothing too centralized, not too much KYC, if you lose your keys, like you lose your real estate, do you lose your gold? Um, so I wanted to see what everyone thought about that yeah. and uh, where that goes. So, so great point. Oh, so all the securities governing bodies, um, you know, I'll start with the SEC and um, and then I'll, I'll call on lawyer Dottie to talk about the similarities in, in Canada. Um, but a lot of the uh, a lot of assets, actually, every real world asset and every security technically can't be lost. So there's uh, there's uh, function within the securities world called a transfer agent. Um, and essentially what they do is they hold books and records. And legally, a security cannot be lost or stolen. Um, so one of the important things that uh, we're seeing with a lot of these tokenization of real world asset platforms is the ability to do things like claw back illicit trades uh, to, you know, if, if somebody were to hack in, the ability to, to actually pull that asset out of the wallet that it was taken from um, and uh, and and uh, put back into the original wallet. So those are called transcriptions, and uh, they're definitely a, a really big part of the the real world asset, um, you know, uh, adoption to need to 
bring when it comes to um, you know comparing crypto assets where if you you know if someone has their keys and they're able to actually send crypto out of your wallet you know it's it's lost forever uh, whereas it doesn't function that way with securities so lawyer.eth you know what what are the similarities in Canada um, and what can you add on to what I just said yeah I mean so it, it's it's the only thing I can add is really to just expand on the idea of the control that you do have over a token when you have you know the, the control over the smart contract so yes with respect to who can transfer it and 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 you know on different blockchains that control can be anything right like this is all um can be customized and there are you know you know there's provenance out there there's a lot of blockchain companies that are really building for the purpose of um, solving these problems and um but with respect to canada and, and in the states being different I mean, it's, it's very hand in glove they're they're working together i can't speak to it being um like it's not the same thing but ultimately we're going to solve the same problems with um and I think that the regulations will come to look similar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the word control because the the language in U.S. law is good control location. So each securities transaction needs to uh, have what's called good control location. Um, you know, meaning that um, it actually has to go through regulated parties. Um, so that actually is a great segue. Um, you know, I wanted to ask the group here what they thought about current regulations and, um, you know, existing with, with securities and, and different assets and how that's going to apply. And, and then there more, what needs to change, if anything, around, um, you know, the, the regulation that, that uh, does with securities? Does blockchain enhance what exists today or is it something that needs a change? Pete. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, sorry, I, I clued out for a little for a moment there, so I missed part of your question. Um, but I, I think that, um, sorry, can you can you repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, essentially, you know, there's existing regulations surrounding assets and securities uh, today, and I wanted to get your thoughts on: Do these laws make sense in a blockchain-based ecosystem moving forward, or is there or are there things that need to change? Are there things that need to make it more accessible, more tradable? You know, how are we going to? Uh, you know, really adopt regulation that makes sense moving forward um, if it's needed or is what exists today perfectly fine? Yeah, and I think on a granular level, you probably need more regulation in each area. Um, but just in fact, just for the sheer ability to get tokenized assets in theory and law, um, America seems to be ahead of the game. Great. I get sometimes go back and forth with the Howey test and whether I feel that the four prongs are outdated and whether or not they uh, really, I mean, not outdated, but whether we look at them as black and white, like too much black and white, where there's a, a lot of gray area with securities. Uh, I think there is there is gray area, but I think that like, if you listen to Michael Saylor, he really explains it well. I think he does it better than that, the Howey test. And it's almost like just a high level. Um, if I tell you to buy this, is it, is it unethical? Or should I have to disclose some things I know about it? For example, I, if I tell you to buy Apple, you want to know if I know something about Apple, if I was saying, you know, somebody might know about Apple. But if I go tell you to buy corn, then, you know, invest in corn futures, there's no potential ethical dilemma there. It is not a security. There's no CEO who could die that would cause problems. There's no internal management that could cause problems. And I think the Howey test actually gets away from that when that should be the, the core of it. The core should be, are there disclosures that would need to be made to be able to tell someone to buy it ethically? Um, and so that's the difference. Like, for example, Bitcoin falls into that. I don't think that, um, you know, there's nobody who could die. There's no mismanagement. There's no, it, you know, it resembles something more like a commodity than, say, shares of a company or, um, you know, in a better example, in my view, maybe shares, maybe Ethereum, where, you know, there is kind of a CEO. If he died, the price would go down. Um, they are making big changes to the core functionality. If that didn't go well, it would go down. You know, to me, it seems like it might be a security, but. Uh, I, I'm digressing a little, but I think it's really important. Yeah, I mean, to be on Ethereum, um, I'm really conflicted. Obviously, I'm a big crypto guy, love the space, and obviously want the Bitcoin ETF. But I feel like the Ethereum ETF, you know, I don't understand how it could pass, especially with staking. So pretty much as an ETF, people can buy it, put in their retirement accounts. But at the same time, you know, people that got in early that helped develop the software have all this Ethereum, can stake it and create more of this asset that people are buying for their retirement account. It just doesn't seem like something that's a very fair thing to, to create an ETF or a highly regulated thing out of. Well, it doesn't thoughts. feel, it doesn't, I agree. It doesn't feel like it's, uh, it, like it's, there's too much control, I think, right? Um, and 
Like, I, I don't know if the, the inflationary aspect by itself doesn't necessarily bother me as long as it's sustainable. I mean, Bitcoin is, is inflationary, but it has a, a, a known monetary policy. I don't know exactly how Ethereum works, but I think it's pretty reliable in terms of knowing the inflation. Like, inflation's not a problem as long as you, well, it can be, but as long as you know, it's like, imagine you have a yardstick and you're or a measuring tape and you're a construction worker and your, um, and your measuring tape may change. You just can't build a house. But if you knew that every three days it would, you know, get one as long, it would grow by some uh, multiple, then you wouldn't be able to build a house. You just have to work and do more math. So, um, you know, these things with steady inflation, I don't find necessarily problematic. It's the, it's the internal level of control, the things that go can go wrong and the way that you could actually have inside information about something that makes it problematic. If you could have inside information and secrets that are non-public, then it really looks like there should be disclosures. Well, Ethereum actually is deflationary now, um, and it's one of the things. It's it's kind of weird if they were to make an ETF, like you know, stakers keep getting more ETH. You know, transaction fees are burned, and I don't know. It just seems like the it's a rich get richer type of thing. Whereas Bitcoin, you know, you actually put in real energy and resources to mine it. I don't know. Just, I've been thinking about it a lot, and like I almost I feel like it would uh, Ethereum ETF would almost be bad for the long term growth of the space, whereas a Bitcoin one would be good. Yeah, I mean, I think we've come to the same conclusions through different avenues. I, I don't think it's a, a bit sorry. Uh, Ethereum ETF is makes a lot of sense. Um, like I, I don't see Ethereum as an investment in that way. I, I see that, like I see Ethereum going up naturally. Everything will, and it will become more important, so it will go up. But that will make the chain less usable. Um, and so there's some sort of cap there. Like I, it, it almost becomes unusable at a certain price. So you know, I'm not as I'm not as excited about that. Um, except for you know, the utilities there, right? So there's, there's certainly an investment thesis, but over the long term, um, but you know, in any case, sorry, like the, the question was whether it's a security. And, and so you're right that it's deflationary. I think your, your issue was more that it's, you know, you're printing new ones into, new, into people's hands. Um, but my, my point there was that it's a, it's a known mechanism. And then my own counter to that is, well, that mechanism just changed and it could change in the future. So I think it's this, this uncertainty and the way that as there are people who have control over it, that's to be what falls into, uh, makes it fall into, uh, probably a security but ultimately i think it will be deemed not a security because enough people want that yeah and just to bridge it back to the real world asset side i want to hit on something that you said lawyer.eth which is around um disclosures of different assets and kind of knowing um you know intent of of the people that control these assets and who actually manage these assets um and i think one of the one of the the interesting things and one of the dilemmas that we're going to be encountering is a lot of the uh, examples of real world assets that we're seeing uh, with the goal of tokenization is they're private versus public. So when you have a public asset, you have a set amount of disclosures that you have to make every year and companies, public companies spend millions of dollars a year uh, making sure that all uh, available information is public. There's rules around uh, trading these assets in terms of who has that insider information that you mentioned before. With private assets, there's not really uh, any laws around what you have to disclose. So this is an interesting point of the you know securities governing bodies of whichever uh, country that the security is held in or, or managed in or, or really originated in is do there have to be increased disclosures for these private assets? Do there has, do there have to be rules around um, who can trade them? If I'm someone who is you know part of the asset and is on the managing team and I have specific information, am I even allowed to buy or sell these private assets? Currently, yes, but this is before a an environment in which these private assets are really tradable. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts there, but w would love to, you know, kick it first to lawyer.eth. Sorry, I, I was just having to take a call. Jackson, can you jump in there? Yeah, I, honestly, I, I'm not, I didn't have too many thoughts here, Alec. Um, can you maybe, uh, can we move to another question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, for everyone who's been joining, you know, really great to have you. Again, this is the Infinio Twitter space. We're going to be doing this every Tuesday at noon. Uh, we're going to be exploring the digitization and tokenization of real-world assets. Um, you know, as Infinio, we are working on uh, the tokenization and digitization of whole life insurance. Um, you know, I've previously done a lot of work. Jackson's done a lot of work um, in assets like real estate art. Uh, so we're just talking about, um, you know, what, what is currently going on in the space? What needs to happen? So I think... We can move on from regulation. We probably hit this enough. I want to talk about the secondary markets. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about this liquidity aspect. And I think that's why a lot of people are so attracted to the idea of tokenization of real world assets. So I wanted to talk to you, Jackson, and ask you, 
you know, what are you seeing on the secondary market side uh, in terms of, of trading? Is the volume and uh, furthermore, what needs to happen to really you know boost mainstream adoption of buying into private assets and then being able to trade secondary markets? So I, it's really funny to me that everyone always talks about one of the benefits of tokenization being liquidity as if liquidity is just a switch that you can kind of turn on and off. And in at least in my experience and what I've seen in the secondary markets is liquidity is not uh, an if you build it, they will come type of uh, thing. Liquidity is not ne necessarily needed for some of these assets that we're seeing be tokenized. But um, it's also not coming for some of the smaller cap assets that we'd like to see uh, trade. And I think that's just due to the difficulty of actually accessing these assets right now and um, really just people not knowing about them. And I think that that kind of just stems from a lack of enticement from the, uh, the assets themselves. Um, one thing that I found really interesting when reading about this new Bitcoin ETF coming up is that they're going to be looking potentially for a place for it to trade 24-7. And if that is needed, there really aren't um, exchanges that are licensed to do that right now outside of these ATSs. And so you can potentially see these um, ATSs such as T0, Securitize, INX, um, be looked at as a place for the Bitcoin ETF to trade. And yeah. so um, that's all very, very interesting to me. And an offering like that coming into the tokenization space would definitely drive the sort of liquidity that we're looking for. And I think it just comes from a lack of offerings that people are truly interested that would need that sort of liquidity that we expect in a traditional um, equity. Yeah. And, and just so the audience knows what Jackson's referring to when he says ATS is an alternative trading system. Uh, effectively, they are licensed uh, broker dealers that can uh, actually uh, permit trading and ma uh, matching of orders of different private assets that are securities. Um, so some of the ATS, as he mentioned, uh, namely Securitize, INX, they built platforms that are specifically designed to trade real, real world assets. The reason that you can't go onto, um, you know, a Uniswap or uh, one of these, you know, non-regulated exchanges to trade real world assets is because there's so many uh, laws around uh, KYC and AML. Being able to actually know who the person that's buying the asset is, making sure that they're not a bad actor. Uh, the L law, uh, laws are really surrounding, um, you know, is this person someone that is a person of interest for the government? Is it someone that has access to a large amount of treasuries that they can use to purchase these assets? Because the last thing that the government wants uh, is for these you know, regulated securities to be listed on markets where they can't keep track of who uh, owns these assets. So, you know, obviously there's an ethical question um, of, of whether that's something that should be changed or improved. Uh, but furthermore, you know, I, I wanted to, to, to see if anyone had any thoughts on how blockchain can actually improve this process of being able to keep track of who owns these uh, these types of assets. Yeah. So there's the, there's the overall liquidity, which I, I, I you know, I don't disagree with Jackson overall, but then there's also the question of, and I think this probably has plays into overall liquidity, but, um, you know, if you have assets that, you're, that are on the blockchain, loans are very easy, right? They may have to be over collateralized, but you can have it right in the smart, smart contract that it, the thing, the asset goes into the contract and gets paid out to the lender if it does, isn't paid back or, or what have you. So you now have things that may be like, for example, a share in the Van Gogh painting that, you know, you maybe weren't able to very easily borrow against. You can go quickly, easily borrow, get some Bitcoin, do what you need to do and then pay it back in time. And both you and the lender are guaranteed without a middleman um, to be secure in the process. So, um, once these things get wrapped as real world assets, they then get involved that in this you know world of DeFi that may be more compliant, but still takes advantage of all the, a lot of the benefits of um, the decentralized finance world, which includes you know, the ability to get loans against your your wrapped assets very easily peer to peer. Absolutely, um, yeah, and I think you know one of uh, kind of where we're headed is uh, people. To Jackson's point, people are not going and trading on these ATSs today. There is limited supply. There's not too many buyers on these platforms. So a lot of people have this idea of going to tokenize an asset, bringing it to an ATS to where it's not really going to be traded. So we're seeing a lot of companies like uh, like Ondo Finance, like Resonate, like, um, like Centrifuge that are focused in taking real world assets and actually being able to perform uh, loans against them uh, in a compliant manner to allow them to invest in other things, which is something that we're actually very focused on at Infinio is we have, you know, we're tokenizing and digitizing this real world asset uh, that really functions as a fixed income alternative. 
when you have um, an asset like that, it's really easy to uh, assess value to it or assign value to it, to which, you know, instantaneous loans can happen. Right now, and the problem that we're solving for in the insurance space is these whole life policies, um, you know, the, the ability to take out a policy loan is there. The policy loan comes from the carrier that actually um, provides the insurance to the policy owner. One of the, the, there's a couple things that can be improved here. One is the timing of uh, the actual loan. Um, so one thing we're focused on is actually being able to make these loans instantaneous. Um, but then furthermore, being able to um, you know, do it in a way where there's a, a essentially a lending pool similar to DeFi um, and you know, people being able to know the value ahead of time, know the rates. And additionally, when you add uh, other lenders into the market, you, what you get is, is competition, which leads to you know, better terms for your, your loan. So Noah, I wanted to uh, get back to you for a second. And if you could talk about, um, and, and lawyer.eth too, uh, you know, in terms of DeFi and what's already built, you know, what do those rails look like where you're able to actually borrow instantaneously on an asset? Um, okay, so it would be we're, we're talking about crypto. I mean, those rails exist. You just have to add some um, whitelist KYC wallets to the process, and, and of course, those platforms that are doing that are working that, that like INX and whatever they are, they're doing it right. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things is uh, you know the on-the-chain uh, narrative is coming up as well. I think it's really important for uh, liquidity in general. I know we talked about the lack of liquidity before, um, and you know a lot of these products are fragmented on various blockchains. Um, but you know, hopefully, as the whole you know layer zero tips off and the omni chain thing keeps going, you know, you can put an asset out there on you know Provenance, for instance, and borrow on Arbitrum or or vice versa. Um, I think it's super important um, to have this space grow properly. That you know everyone is chain agnostic and not just um, chain agnostic, but also not you know but hold into EBM or Cosmos or whatever kind of bigger ecosystems it might be. Um, but yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. So I think what we're going to do is um, we're going to get close to to wrapping, uh, but I'm going to uh, ask each of the panelists uh, to just kind of talk about really quickly what's the most exciting thing that um, that they think is coming in the real world assays um, and and kind of your thoughts on, on what the next or what the foreseeable future looks like. I'm happy to kick it off. At least for me, it's going back to what we just said about the liquidity. And it's not necessarily that we're going to see liquidity magically enter the space. But what I think that is bound to happen as more and more people start to understand tokenization, the benefits from a management perspective, and then additionally, the built-in benefits you can add for your investors, that we will see an offer built that is so enticing to investors that it draws people in. And it's not going to feel like a Web3 experience when you invest in this token. It's going to feel like a truly native just web two experience with a token added to it and it's all going to be blockchain in the back end and once someone figures out that secret sauce that's going to bring in tons and tons of liquidity to that asset in particular but um people in base and different uh different assets so yeah that's my my thing yeah i think think that's right like i'm I'm excited about all the different spaces opening up to the idea about Transparency is better, right? Especially in government, but um, even then, those businesses can each other. The more they're transparent, um, you know, the more you know what you're getting, or you know that what they're saying is true, what they're holding is true, what they're allocating one way or the other. All of that is good, and the blockchain is really the best tool for that. So I'm excited to see how that opens up. I mean, you know, Infinio is doing what it's doing in the insurance space, and you know, I have so much excitement about that. But I know that every other every space with with financial products is going to benefit, and every investor. Ultimately, at the end of the day, in a more transparent financial world, will benefit. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with that. But I think what I'm most excited about is kind of just uh, you know increasing the efficiency and connectivity of the world. Um, like for instance, what you know Goldfinch is doing, right? Where you can, you know, me sitting in Philadelphia can give a loan out to someone or a, biz- a small business loan in Southeast Asia at 13. Um, percent I just think it's really cool. I mean, you're allowing people around the world access to capital they wouldn't have before. And these loans and payments are happening instantaneously. Um, I think that's just re- really amazing. You know, I think it's going to um, really complete crypto's goal of kind of bank, not banking the unbanked, but, you know, allowing bank typees to the unbanked and people that don't have access to a healthy banking system. Um, so I'm just really looking forward to seeing kind of that progress and how the whole community of the whole community aspect of crypto can kind of become a community aspect of, uh, you know, this new financial world we're in. 
Awesome. Well, I really want to thank um, you know my co-hosts Noah Pollock and Jackson Blau, as well as uh, Lawyer Dot who was our our special guest speaker and will be a frequent guest uh, on this Twitter space. Um, again, we are going to be doing this every Tuesday at noon uh, to explore the digitization and tokenization of real world assets. Um, you know, we highly encourage you to follow uh, the the M5 podcast through Infinio, which is hosted every week by Dr. Robert Murphy. Uh, he speaks to amazing guests that are working on digitization of real world assets. Uh, he talks about it from a macro view. He talks about it from a from a, a very you know viewed in lens. Um, so definitely encourage all of that. As well as uh, you know, feel free to reach out if you want to learn more about Infinio or what we're doing and how or you know digitizing uh, whole life insurance and trying to improve that industry by putting these real world assets on chain and making it accessible for everybody and scalable. Uh, you know, please go through our website or feel out to me directly, Alec. Dot Beckman, A L E C dot B E C K M A N at Infinio dot AI. Um, you can find me, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm always uh, around for the community. Um, you know, thanks again to everybody uh, for listening, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you next week.